All around, the Indians began jumping up, running forward, dodging down, jumping up again, down again, all the time going toward the soldiers. Right away, all of the white men went crazy. Instead of fighting us, they turned their guns upon themselves. Almost before we could get to them, every one of them was dead. They killed themselves. These are the words of Wooden Leg, a northern Cheyenne who faced off against Custer and his 7th Cavalry at the Battle of Little Bighorn, a fight we will examine today from this young warrior's point of view. But who was Wooden Leg? How credible of a source is he when it comes to Custer's last stand? And what really kicked off the Great Sioux War of 1876? My name's Josh, and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. In the 1920s, Thomas Marquis, a physician, began interviewing Northern Cheyenne living on the reservation in Montana. At that time, there were still 17 men alive who, as adults, had fought at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Wooden leg among them. That being the case, much of what you're about to hear originates from Dr. Marquis' interviews with Wooden Leg, which were translated and compiled in the book Wooden Leg, A Warrior Who Fought Custer. Now I'll spare you the pain of me attempting to pronounce Wooden Leg in the Cheyenne tongue, but that was not his given name at birth. Born in the Black Hills sometime in the year 1858, Wooden Leg was initially known as Eats from the Hand. It wasn't until he was a teenager that he'd take to calling himself Wooden Leg, inspired by a favorite uncle of the same name. The elder Wooden Leg was a crow, taken captive around the age of 10 and then adopted into the Cheyenne. Legend has it he was able to walk further than anyone else, seemingly without growing tired. Even as an old man, he could outstep any youngster who tried to match him. The younger Wooden Leg also became quite the walker, and it wasn't long before his young friends began jokingly referring to him by his favorite uncle's name. Quote, I liked the name. I liked the man who bore it, and I liked the honor of comparison with him. I told my father I wished to be known as Wooden Leg. It was a common custom to pass down names to junior relatives. My father told me that when the right time came, he would confer upon me the new name. The time came when I was about 17 years old. End quote. And just for the sake of simplicity, I will refer to Eats from the Hand as Wooden Leg for the remainder of this episode. Now, like I said, he was a northern Cheyenne, and considering that he was born in 1858, Wooden Leg really was among the last generation of his people to grow to adulthood living in the traditional Cheyenne manner. When he was a kid, there was still buffalo aplenty, and his people continued making war upon their age-old enemies, sometimes the Pawnee, but mostly the Crow and Shoshone. And their territory at this time ranged from the Black Hills all the way west to the Bighorn River in Montana. Wasn't always that way, though. Originally from the Great Lakes region near Hudson Bay, the Cheyennes migrated southwest to what's now Minnesota in the 1600s. A century later, they could be found in North Dakota, and they likely acquired horses sometime around the year 1730, at which point they were able to push out onto the Great Plains and begin following the buffalo. Now, by the time Wooden Leg was born, the Great Migration of Settlers headed west was already in full swing, and clashes with the U.S. government were not only inevitable, but growing more and more common. Following Red Cloud's War, you had the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, in which Cheyenne allies, the Lakota, were granted a large reservation pretty much encompassing the western half of present-day South Dakota, including the sacred Black Hills. In addition, there was a large swath of unceded territory in Wyoming and Montana, set aside as hunting ground for both the Lakota and the northern Cheyenne. This included the Powder River country where Wooden Leg would spend much of his youth. Skip ahead to 1875... They discovered gold up in the Black Hills, and you know what happens next. The U.S. government attempted to purchase the hills, but the tribes weren't looking to sell. Further negotiations were called for, but most of the bands just flat out refused to come in and talk. There was a deadline of January 31st, 1876, at which point all free Roman Lakota and Cheyenne were to check in at the agency. And once they failed to do so, General Sheridan gave the go-ahead to commence military action and drive these so-called hostiles to the reservations. Obviously, this is a bit of an oversimplification. There was a ton more nuance and historical context involved, but in short, this deadline and the refusal to meet it was what kicked off the Great Sioux War of 1876. And to hear Woodenleg tell it, this was not really understood by his people during this period. 
While there were some Cheyenne who chose to live on the reservations, his father was against the idea, saying that Indians were not made to live like that and that it would be better to remain on what they called their hunting grounds, which, remember, they were legally allowed to do per that 1868 treaty. Interestingly enough, a certain George Armstrong Custer felt pretty much the same way, at least in sentiment. Per his book, My Life on the Plains, published just a few months before his death, quote, I often think that if I were an Indian, I would greatly prefer to cast my lot among those of my people who adhere to the free open plains rather than submit to the confined limits of a reservation, there to be the recipient of the blessed benefits of civilization, with its vices thrown in without stint or measure, end quote. Nonetheless, I reckon Custer had a job to do. And following that July 31st deadline, any time Wooden Leg's relatives from the reservation would visit, they'd warn that the soldiers were coming. A caution still largely met with disbelief, once again due to the Fort Laramie Treaty. So long as the Cheyenne didn't make war upon the whites, which according to Wooden Leg they purposely avoided, they could just go on living and hunting as they pleased in their designated territory. Or so they thought. Now let me just say real quick, my main source, as far as research goes... As I mentioned earlier, is the book Wooden Leg, A Warrior Who Fought Custer. I also consulted Mark Lee Garner's excellent The Earth is All That Lasts. All things considered, this episode is not meant to be an exhaustive or definitive look at the War of 1876 or even the Battle of Little Bighorn, which, don't worry, we will be discussing here shortly. Nor is it the end-all be-all of Cheyenne history. I'm focusing almost exclusively on Wooden Leg and his version of events a version which was shared some 50-odd years after the fact. Just something to keep in mind. That said, I will be covering Custer's Last Stand and several other engagements much more in depth later on this year as standalone episodes. So if it seems like I'm glossing anything over today, just know that I will be revisiting many of these topics in greater detail in the very near future. Prior to the events we're about to discuss, Wooden Leg doesn't really speak much about coming in contact with the Whites. Obviously, there was some. His father had even traveled all the way to Washington, D.C. a few years before his birth, and his older brother was killed by soldiers either sometime in the late 1860s or early 1870s. In what battle, I do not know. And then there was the normal contact they would have had with traders and trappers and the like. That said, by 1876, they were avoiding such interactions. And as I previously hinted at, the idea that the army was coming after him was mostly met by disbelief. Still, though, even as they chose to remain free, they would routinely receive visitors from the reservation who would beg them to return with them and repeating the warnings over and over again. The soldiers are coming. The soldiers are coming. And sure enough, one day the soldiers finally arrived. According to Wooden Leg, quote, early in the morning, an old man arose and went to the top of a nearby knoll to observe or pray as old men were in the habit of doing. He had only been there a few moments when he began shouting toward the camp. The soldiers are right here. Already the attacking white men were between the horse herd and the camp. Women screamed and children cried for their mothers. Old people tottered and hobbled away to get out of reach of the bullets singing among the lodges. Braves seized whatever weapons they had and tried to meet the attack. End quote. Now Wooden Leg did his part catching a pony and firing a few arrows toward the long knives before helping to carry two young kids off to safety. Once they was out of harm's way, he attempted to return to the fight, but it weren't much use. The soldiers were victorious, and the Cheyennes watched from a distance as their lodges were destroyed, along with most of their possessions. Now, this little dust-up would go down in history as the Battle of Powder River. It occurred on March 17, 1876, about 35 miles southwest of present-day Broadus, Montana, or Broadus, Montana. If you're one of the three people in existence who's ever been to Broadus, Montana, and I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, my bad. These troopers there at the Powder River were under the leadership of Colonel Joseph J. Reynolds, who, incidentally, would be court-martialed for his actions during and directly following the fight. Although the army was successful in destroying the Cheyenne Lodges and seizing their horses, they were still only able to kill just one warrior. And to make matters worse for old Reynolds, the Cheyenne conducted a counter-raid that night and got most of their ponies back, around 500 head total. Nevertheless, the loss of property was devastating, and without shelter in freezing conditions, several more Cheyennes would perish. Luckily, after a few days, they were able to locate a camp of Oglala, under the legendary Crazy Horse, where they were received with full hospitality. Quote, 
They fed us to fullness and gave us temporary shelter and robes. At night, a council was held by the chiefs of the two bands. At the council, our people told about the soldier attack. It was decided that the Oglalas and the Cheyennes should go together to the Hunk Papa Sioux, located northeastward from us. The next forenoon, all of us set out in that direction, end quote. Forenoon, by the way, is just a fancy way of saying morning. And yeah, I did have to look that one up on Google. Now, these Hunk Papa Sioux were sitting bulls bunch, and they numbered more than the Cheyenne and Oglala combined. I'm sure this was a consideration when linking up, you know, safety in numbers, especially with soldiers about. And it weren't long before they were joined by the Minikanju under the leadership of Lame Deer. So now, in addition to Wooden Leg Cheyennes, which, being the smallest, numbered around 400, you also had three separate bands of Lakota. And when you've got such a large gathering of people, it doesn't take long for food to grow scarce, not to mention grass for the horses. That being the case, they moved out as one in search of game. And as they journeyed, they continued growing in number. Stragglers from the reservation, Sans Ark, Blackfeet Sioux, Assiniboines, and even a group that Wooden Leg referred to as Waist and Skirt Indians, whom he described as being very poor and having very little in the way of possessions, including horses. They used dogs and travois to haul their scant belongings. Just a little side note, but I'm not really sure exactly who these waist and skirt Indians were, but I'm thinking they possibly could have been a band of Yankton or Santee Sioux from further east. Wooden Leg did state that they camped in a little group outside of the Hunk Papa Circle, and from what I gather, the big chief of the Santee, who was present at the Battle of Little Bighorn, was good friends with Sitting Bull. I'm just speculating, though. If you know who these so-called waist and skirt people are, please hit me up at josh at wildwestextra.com. If it helps any, Wooden Leg also refers to them as the no-clothing people. Later, another bunch of Cheyenne joined the Southern Cheyenne under Chief Lame White Man, and westward they traveled, slowly just allowing their horses to feed and build up strength as the young men took to searching for bison. According to Wooden Leg, a large council was held each evening as members of the various bands planned their next move. There was not an ultimate destination in mind, rather they were just going to wherever good grazing and ample game could be found. Also, once again, per Wooden Leg, they were avoiding white people at all costs, and they still felt like they were rightfully within the boundary of their ordained hunting grounds. Somewhere around the middle of May, they arrived on Rosebud Creek in present-day Bighorn County, Montana where they were lucky enough to locate an abundance of buffalo. They remained in this camp for about a week or so, just hunting, but soon enough began traveling up the valley, shoring up meat in the process. At what Wooden Leg referred to as the fourth Rosebud Camp, they were joined by additional Reservation Cheyenne, who warned of approaching bluecoats, soldiers. At this development, Wooden Leg and ten others departed for the Tongue River, both to hunt bison and to scout for any signs of trouble and they were successful on both fronts. Not only were they able to down a few buffalo, but they also located a soldier camp. They followed cautiously for a bit, contemplating making a raid on the horses, but in the end deemed it too risky and returned to the big village to share the news. As a result, Wooden Leg would ride out later that night with a combined force of Lakota and Cheyenne, some 800 strong, under the leadership of Crazy Horse. And the next morning, June 17, 1876, they commenced to attack in General George R. Crook and his troops. This fight, now known as the Battle of the Rosebud, would end up lasting several hours, and despite both sides losing roughly around the same amount of men, it is generally considered a win for the indigenous. General Crook claimed victory, just from the mere fact that he held the ground after the warriors departed, but Wooden Leg and his comrades also felt like they came out on top. This wasn't the usual hit-and-run type attack. They had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the army for hours and showed exactly what they was made of. One of the officers present, Captain Anson Mills, would later recall, quote, They were the best cavalry soldiers on earth. In charging up towards us, they exposed little of their person, hanging on with one arm around the neck and one leg over the horse, firing and lancing from underneath the horse's necks, so that there was no part of the Indian at which we could aim, end quote. Now, if you don't mind, I'll add a little historical context to help set the scene. Shortly following the battle, the Crow and Shoshone scouts serving under Crook decided to pack up and head on home, after which the general moved his troops some 40-odd miles to the south and was effectively immobilized for the next several weeks, just waiting on reinforcements and supplies. 
That being the case, Crook and his men would take no part in the fighting soon to come, leaving just two remaining columns active in the field. Colonel John Gibbon and his several companies worth of cavalry and infantry were up on the Yellowstone with plans to march south. Joining him would be General Terry, commander of the Department of Dakota. The other column, Custer 7th Cavalry, was also on the Yellowstone and consisted of 12 companies, or more specifically, 566 troopers, 31 officers, 35 Crow and Arikara scouts, 7 civilian scouts, 6 mule packers, and a partridge in a pear tree. Sorry, I know I used that little partridge line a few episodes ago, but I couldn't help it. Important to note, neither Gibbon, Terry, nor Custer were aware of what occurred down on the Rosebud. And as fate would have it, it was towards the Rosebud where George Armstrong Custer began marching his troops on June 22nd in search of hostiles. As for Wooden Leg and the others, they broke camp the next morning and headed toward the Bighorn River, their numbers further reinforced by additional Cheyenne and a handful of Arapaho. The initial plan was to travel north up the Bighorn Valley, but someone spotted a passel of antelope to the west, so they headed that away. Now, Wooden Leg, when speaking of the various tribal councils, stated that, quote, each tribe operated its own internal government, the same as if it were entirely separated from the others. The chiefs of the different tribes met together as equals. There was only one to be considered as being above all of the others. This was Sitting Bull. He was recognized as the one old man chief of all the camps combined, end quote. You know, it's funny, I'm sure the label old man chief was just a turn of phrase, but at this time, Sitting Bull would have only been in his early 40s. Then again, Wooden Leg was just 18, and I reckon to most people that age, anything over 40 is ancient, unless you've got daddy issues, but that's an entirely different episode. Now, the large camp continued west, leaving behind a trail that, according to Wooden Leg, a blind person could have followed, and on the 24th of June, they stopped and began raising their lodges along the banks of the Little Bighorn, just south of where the Crow Agency now stands. Wooden Leg, when speaking of the size of the camp, said that there were around 300 Cheyenne lodges, with about the same amount, give or take, a Blackfeet Sioux. The Sansarks had more, the Miniconchu and the Oglalas each had more than the Sansarks, and the Hunk Papas, Sitting Bulls people, had twice as many as the Cheyennes. How accurate this count truly is, I don't know. Keep in mind that there were multiple people living in each lodge. And to this day, I don't think anyone knows exactly how many natives were camped there on the Little Bighorn. That said, it is considered to be one of the largest gatherings of Plains tribes in all of known history. A more modern, albeit still rough, estimate is that there were around 1,000 lodges housing between three to 7,000 people, with anywhere from one to 2,000 warriors. According to Wooden Leg, this large gathering would only enjoy one night at this village before Custer and his men came a-calling. And the battle that followed is perhaps the most famous and studied of all the so-called Indian Wars. Be that as it may, Wooden Leg had other things in mind. I had no thought then of any fighting to be done in the near future. We had driven away the soldiers on the Upper Rosebud seven days ago. It seemed likely that it would be a long time before they would trouble us again. My mind was occupied mostly by such thoughts as regularly are the uppermost in the minds of young men. I was 18 years old, and I liked girls. End quote and amen. And Wooden Leg wasn't lying. He and his brother paid a visit to the Sands Art Camp on the night of the 24th and literally spent the entire night dancing with the young ladies. Didn't even get back to their own lodge till after daybreak and, as such, ended up sleeping in pretty late on the 25th. Matter of fact, it was the arrival of the soldiers, ultimately, that roused young Wooden Leg from his slumber. He could hear rifle fire in the distance as women were screaming and trying to locate their young, while the older men began calling out, The soldiers are here! Young men, go out and fight! Heeding these words, Wooden Leg rushed to prepare himself for battle, donning a new shirt and a pair of fancy beaded moccasins before quickly applying his war paint. He'd have liked to have braided and oiled his hair as well, but there weren't no time. Besides, his daddy had just caught his favorite pony and was rushing him. These preparations, by the way, were not just an exercise in vanity. This was done with death in mind. And each individual Cheyenne warrior would do the same. To quote Wooden Leg, Every Indian wants to look his best when he goes to meet the Great Spirit. So the dressing up is done whether the imminent danger is an oncoming battle or sickness or injury at times of peace. The only exclusion were warriors who had special instructions from the medicine men. They believed themselves to be impervious to bullets, so they'd simply head into the fight half-naked. 
In their minds, they were in no danger of dying, therefore there was no need to prepare to meet their maker. In short order, Wooden Leg hopped on the back of his horse and began following a large group of likewise-mounted warriors around and beyond the circle of Hunk Papa Lodges where he got his first glimpse at the Bluecoats. Quote, I went out with a throng of Sioux until we got beyond and behind the white men. By this time, though, they had mounted their horses and were hiding themselves in the timber. A band of Indians were with the soldiers. It appeared they were Crows or Shoshones. Most of these Indians had fled back up the valley. Some were east of the river and were riding away over the hills beyond. End quote. Now, Wooden Leg didn't know it, but these soldiers there in the timber were Major Reno and his men. Custer ordered them to attack the village, but Reno quickly found himself outmatched. For whatever reason, he gave a command to dismount and form a skirmish line, at which point the inhabitants of the large camp, quote, came back at me like a nest of hornets. Within a few minutes, Reno had no choice but to order his men back into a stand of cottonwoods near the river. And that's where they were when Wooden Leg and his companions arrived, for a moment at least. Suddenly, quote, the hidden soldiers came tearing out on horseback from the woods. I was around on that side when they came out. I whirled my horse and lashed it into a dash to escape from them. All others of my companions did the same, but we soon discovered they were not following us. They were running away from us. They were going as fast as their tired horses could carry them across an open valley space and toward the river. We stopped, looked a moment, then whipped our ponies into swift pursuit. A great throng of Sioux also coming after them. My distant position put me among the leaders in the chase. End quote. Wooden Leg fired four shots from his old cap and ball six shooter with indifferent results as the warriors closed ranks. He and another Cheyenne by the name of Little Bird rode on each side of a soldier and began striking at him with their pony whips. The trooper managed to turn and put a bullet from his revolver into Little Bird's thigh, at which point Wooden Leg grabs a hold of the rifle strapped to the soldier's back and gives it a yank. I did not harm him further. I do not know what became of him. The jam of oncoming Indians swept me on. But I had now a good soldier rifle, yet I had no cartridges for it. As the soldiers crash into the river, the warriors are still right there mixed in with them. And using that new rifle of his as a club, Wooden Leg knocks an additional two men from the saddle. Somewhere around this time, he spies what he calls an enemy Indian firing from behind a knoll. Wooden Leg dismounts and begins sneaking up on the man, but before he and the others could get to him, the mystery warrior was struck by a bullet. He weren't out of the fight, though. Just wounded. As he raised his rifle to commence firing, Wooden Leg and the others rushed in and finished him off. I crashed a blow of my rifle upon his head. Others beat and stabbed him to death. Now, earlier Wooden Leg supposed that these natives were either Crow or Shoshone, but so far as I'm aware, there were no Shoshone present at the Battle of Little Bighorn. I believe they were all either Crow or Arikara. Matter of fact, Bloody Knife and Arikara, who was said to have been one of Custer's favorite scouts, had just gotten killed back in that timber before Reno and his men made the break toward the river. For what it's worth, later on in his old age, Wooden Leg did seem pretty confident that this old boy he had just helped kill was indeed an Arikara. From there, Wooden Leg would head back and join the others in pillaging the dead and wounded. Major Reno had left 40 men behind during his retreat. That's 40 soldiers who would never again see their loved ones, at least not in this life. Wooden Leg snagged some tobacco out of the pockets of one fallen trooper and a cartridge belt from another before hitting pay dirt. Forty rounds of ammo for that new rifle of his. This gun, by the way, would have been a Springfield Model 1873 breech-loading carbine, also known as a trapdoor, which, if I'm not mistaken, was chambered in 4570. Not exactly a caliber I'd be very excited to get shot with. And after loading that Springfield and topping off his cartridge belt, Wooden Leg set out again to join the fight. Now, in the meantime, Reno and what was led to his command had linked up with Captain Benteen and his three companies as they began to make a stand on a bluff overlooking the river, now known as Reno Hill. A little bit of an oversimplification, sure, but remember, I will be returning to this battle in far greater detail in a few more months, at which point we'll be taking a much closer look at Benteen and Reno up there on that hill. Per Wooden Leg, quote, the soldiers had gone up gulches and a backbone ridge to the top of a steep and high hill. Indians were all about them. Shots were going towards them and coming from them. End quote. Once again, just to add a little quick context, I think I mentioned this earlier, but all total, there were 12 companies of soldiers. Major Reno led three of them on that initial attack. K-2 
Captain Benteen likewise had three companies under his command, and George Armstrong Custer had five. The final 12th company was some distance away and riding shotgun for the slow-moving pack train. Now, as Reno was making his charge, Custer remained on the east side of the river, pushing north. And about the time Reno was falling back into that timber, Custer and his men were likely at or around what's now known as Weir Point, still towards the east. And I say likely because, spoiler alert, neither Custer nor any of his men would survive what was coming. As such, we can only guesstimate as what exactly happened. And part of that guessing is done by using stories from people like Wood and Leg, along with archaeological digs and the positions of the bodies once they were discovered. I think everyone agrees, though, that at some point Custer split his command. There was an attempt on his part to cross the river and attack the village, but this was repulsed as the troopers fell back to what's called Calhoun Hill and north along Battle Ridge. You gotta remember, we're talking just a little over 200 men, and they were split up. In other words, they didn't have a fucking chance. Companies C, I, and L appeared to have perished on or around Calhoun Hill. And Custer may have ridden north and even crossed the river, but he soon returned as companies E and F were driven to Last Stand Hill, also sometimes referred to as Custer's Hill. Company E possibly tried driving the attacking warriors from the ravines to their west before themselves being overcome, and those left on the hill around 40 or 50 men wouldn't last much longer. By the way, all of this has taken place just a little over three and a half miles north of where Benteen and Reno were. With all that in mind, let's go ahead and hear Wooden Legs' version of events. He initially joined the warriors attacking Reno Hill, but soon departed with others to answer Custer's charge on the other side of the camp. As Wooden Leg passed through the village, he paused to swap mounts and give his daddy the tobacco he scored off that dead trooper. From there, Wooden Leg once again crossed the river towards the east, and as he and the others, quote, approached the place of battle, each one chose his own personal course. All of the Indians had come out on horseback. Almost all of them dismounted and crept along the gullies afoot after the arrival near the soldiers. Still, there were hundreds of them riding here and there all the time. Most of them merely chanced in position, but a few of them racing along back and forth in front of the soldiers, in daring movements to exhibit bravery, end quote. At first, Wooden Leg joins other Cheyenne sniping at the soldiers from a distance and just slowly advancing as they do so. These troops were on what he described as a high ridge east of the Cheyenne camp. He also talks about how the Indian bows had a distinct advantage as the warriors could remain concealed and just lob their arrows down on the soldiers, whereas the troopers were forced to expose themselves just to take aim. This slow, long-distance fighting, as Wooden Leg called it, continued for about an hour and a half, at which point around 40 soldiers came galloping from the east part of the ridge toward the river, right smack into the middle of some hidden Sioux and Cheyenne. The troopers stopped and dismounted on a low ridge and were promptly surrounded by warriors. Quote, All around, the Indians began jumping up, running forward, dodging down, jumping up again, down again, all the time going towards the soldiers. Right away, all of the white men went crazy. Instead of fighting us, they turned their guns upon themselves. Almost before we could get to them, every one of them was dead. They killed themselves. End quote. Now, I know this is a controversial topic. Once again, it is something we will fully examine in the very near future. But remember, today we're just looking at Wooden Leg's perspective. For what it's worth, though, he is certainly not the only participant with such claims. The warriors quickly scooped up the guns of these fallen soldiers and turned them on those remaining on the high ridge. And this next part is a little hard to understand, uh, especially for an idiot podcaster like myself. But Wooden Leg, who had been fighting on foot, states, quote, I went back and got my horse and rode around beyond the east end of the ridge. By the time I got there, all of the soldiers were dead. The Indians told me that they had killed only a few of those men, that the men had shot each other and shot themselves. A Cheyenne told me that four soldiers from that part of the ridge had turned their horses and tried to escape going back over the trail where they had come. Three of these men were killed quickly. The fourth one got across the gulch and over a ridge eastward before the pursuing group of Sioux got close to him. His horse was very tired, and the Sioux were gaining on him. He was moving his right arm as though whipping his horse to make it go faster. Suddenly, his right hand went up to his head. With his revolver, he shot himself and fell dead from his horse. End quote. Now, I think he may be discussing the troopers that were on Calhoun Hill, but I honestly don't know. Next, Wooden Leg describes hurrying along to a hillside north of what he calls the Soldier Ridge, 
where his fellow warriors were surrounding a band of blue coats on the north slope. Wooden Leg again fired a couple of shots at long distance, but soon held his fire just to the many warriors jumping up and down in the grass. Didn't want to accidentally take down one of his own. Quote, About that time, all of this band of soldiers went crazy and fired their guns at each other's heads and breasts, or at their own heads and breasts. All of them were dead before the Indians got to them. End quote. Wasn't over yet, though. Wooden Leg then joins a group of warriors firing at yet another bunch of pinned down soldiers possibly Custer and the remainder of his command. The warriors continued their assault until they realized that the troopers were no longer firing. A few fighters crept in close to see what was going on, and they announced that all the soldiers were now dead. Quote, All of the Indians then jumped up and rushed forward. All of the boys and old men on their horses came tearing into the crowd. The air was full of dust and smoke. Everybody was greatly excited. It looked like thousands of dogs might look if all of them were mixed together in a fight. All the Indians were saying that these soldiers also went crazy and killed themselves. I do not know. I could not see them, but I believe they did so. End quote. Wooden Leg would later learn that seven of these troopers had made a break for it down a coulee toward the river, but were surrounded, and if what he heard was true, some of them committed suicide as well. Quote, after the great throng of Indians had crowded upon the little space where there had been the last band of fighting soldiers, a strange incident happened. It appeared that all of the white men were dead, but there was one of them who raised himself to a support on his left elbow. He turned and looked over his left shoulder, and I got a good view of him. His expression was wild, as if his mind was all tangled up and he was wondering what was going on here. In his right hand, he held a six-shooter. Many of the Indians near him were scared by what seemed to have been a return from death to life. But a Sioux warrior jumped forward, grabbed the six-shooter, and wrenched it from the soldier's grasp. The gun was turned upon the white man, and he was shot through the head. Other Indians struck or stabbed him. I think he must have been the last man killed in this great battle, where not one of the enemy got away. Now, Wooden Leg does go on to describe a few of these dead soldiers. That last one who was shot, for instance, he said had a stubbly black beard with a long mustache curled up on the ends. But as far as I know, nobody has been able to name this trooper. We may possibly know the identification of the next three men who caught Wooden Leg's attention, though. One of them had been dressed in buckskin, but by the time Wooden Leg reached the body, he was stripped naked, revealing several tattoos. There's speculation that this could have been Tom Custer, younger brother of George Armstrong. Tom did have ink. And although he was mutilated, it's my understanding that one of these tattoos was later used as a positive ID on the body. Important to point out that according to Wooden Leg, none of the warriors present knew who any of these soldiers were. You'll often read stories of them recognizing Custer, or the claims of his ears being pierced with awls so he'd listen better in the next life. Supposedly that was done by a pair of Southern Cheyenne ladies. As far as Wooden Leg was concerned, he did not learn about Custer until quite some time afterwards. And he didn't hear anyone in the village discussing the man at any point following the battle. This is backed up by others. Shaved Elk and Oglala would later claim, quote, We did not suspect that we were fighting Custer and did not recognize him either alive or dead, end quote. Historian Thomas Marquise, who interviewed Wooden Leg, said that several other Cheyenne participants stated the same, that nobody even knew that Custer was present, some of them not finding out until years later. In all fairness, I must mention that this is somewhat contradicted by Wooden Leg himself. Kind of. While he doesn't mention Custer by name, he does say that one of the waist and skirt warriors told him, quote, I think the big chief of the soldiers we killed was named Long Hair. Long Hair, of course, being a reference to Custer. One of my people killed him. He has known Long Hair many years, and he is sure this was him. He could tell him by the long and wavy yellow hair, end quote. Then later on, either on the second or third night after the battle, there was a great council where Wooden Leg heard of this Long Hair once again, this time from a Hunk Papa chief who claimed, quote, Long Hair was the big chief of the soldiers. I saw him there and I killed him. I know it was him. I could not mistake the long and wavy yellow hair, end quote. This is followed by Wooden Leg stating, I did not hear anyone else during that time make claims of knowing who was the soldier big chief. A lot of issues here, uh, the biggest being that we now know Custer cut his hair short before the battle, so there wasn't anybody recognizing him just from his long golden locks. Remember, like I said earlier, this is Wooden Leg's story, told 50 plus years following the battle. 
I gotta assume that over the decades, he and others told and retold of these events on many an occasion. Now, I personally am of the belief that we should always be cautious at taking any of these first-hand accounts as gospel just all on their own. Human memory is a funny thing. There's just no two ways about it. So we compare and contrast with the other stories told by people who were also there. You weigh what you find against the proven facts, new developments and archaeological digs, all that jazz. And in the end, you'll get a somewhat decent idea of what occurred. I'll touch on this a little bit more toward the end of the episode. Now, even though Wooden Leg didn't directly kill any soldiers during that first day, at least not that he knew of, he would take a scalp. The victim in question was already dead, having been killed either by someone else or at his own hand, but he had a long beard that immediately caught Wooden Leg's attention. This is another body we may know the identity of. Quote, The dead man had a long beard growing from both sides of his face and extending several inches below the chin. He also had a full mustache. All of the beard hair was a light yellow color, as I now recall it. Most of the soldiers had beards growing in different lengths, but this was the longest I saw among them. I skinned one side of the face and half of the chin, so as to keep the long beard yet on the part removed. I got an arrow shaft and tied the strange scalp to the end of it. This I carried in hand as I went looking further. End quote. No way of knowing for sure, but it's possible that this was Custer's adjutant, William W. Cook. Apparently, Cook was well known for his long mutton chops, and sure enough, you look at a picture of the man, and it's exactly what Wooden Leg described. From another soldier, he would take a jacket, and continuing to scavenge, obtained a pair of pants along with a few bottles of whiskey. Once back in camp, Wooden Leg gifted the beard scalp to his grandmother and passed the whiskey out to his friends. And aside from a few slaps on the back, there wasn't a whole hell of a lot of celebration going on. According to Wooden Leg, there were just too many families mourning their dead. And remember, Reno, Benteen, and them others were still up on that hill, and still under attack. Not by Wooden Leg, though. He and four other young Cheyenne were selected to keep guard there at camp. The following day, however, he would once again take up arms, and upon the counsel of some older warriors, make his way down a gulch near the river. This was done in anticipation of the soldiers up there on Reno Hill trying to go down and fetch water. Sure enough, here they come. According to Wooden Leg, quote, Each one had a bucket and each would dip his bucket for water and run back up into the gulch. I put myself with others where we could watch for these men. I shot at one of them just as he straightened up after having dipped his bucket into the water. He pitched forward into the edge of the river. He went wallowing along the stream trying to swim but having a hard time at it. I jumped out from my hiding place and ran toward him. Two Sioux warriors got ahead of me. One of them waited after the man and struck him with a rifle barrel. Finally, he grabbed the man, hit him again, and then dragged him dead to the shore, quite a distance down the river. I kept after him, following down the east bank. Some other Sioux warriors came, and I was the only Cheyenne there. The Sioux agreed that my bullet had been the first blow upon the white soldier, so they allowed me to choose whatever I might of his belongings. End quote. Wooden Leg then searched the dead man's pocket and came away with a folding knife, a plug of chewing tobacco, and a few silver dollars. Allegedly. Full disclosure, while several men from Reno Hill did indeed slip down to the river for water, I think there were like two dozen or so of them awarded the Medal of Honor for doing so, military records do not indicate anyone being killed in the process. According to Mark Lee Gardner in The Earth is All That Last, quote, the brave troopers made the dash in small groups as comrades on the bluff provided cover fire. But even though the warriors were watching for water carriers and got several shots at them, the entire party miraculously reached the river and returned with its precious cargo. Discussing this further in the notes section, Mr. Gardner points out, quote, Wooden Lake claimed he wounded one of the water carriers who fell into the river and was swept downstream and finally overtaken by two Lakota warriors and killed. However, 7th Cavalry regimental records have all the water carriers accounted for, none of whom fell to rejoin their comrades on the hill, end quote. I also reached out to Travis from YouTube's The Story Out West. He's got some amazing videos, by the way. I strongly recommend the one he did titled Surviving Little Bighorn, the Reno Benteen Defense Site. Travis is very knowledgeable regarding this battle, and he pretty much states the same thing as Mr. Gardner, that all the soldiers who went for the water were later accounted for. So why would Wooden Leg lie? Well, I don't know that he did. Like I keep saying, human memories are far from perfect, especially decades later. 
And it's entirely possible he's getting things mixed up from the fighting on the previous day. Or I don't know, maybe he was just telling stories. Now, from what I gather, this would be Wooden Leg's only participation as far as the second day's attack on Reno Hill. He next speaks across in the river and right in the ground where they fought the soldiers from the day before, coming upon the body of a dead black man while doing so. This is the third guy that I hinted at earlier who we may know the identity of. Quote, he was a big man. All of his clothing was gone when I saw him, but he had not been scalped nor cut up like the white men had been. Some Sioux told me that he belonged to their people but was with the soldiers. End quote. This possibly could have been Isaiah Dorman. I don't want to get too far off track, but Dorman was a really fascinating guy I would like to devote an entire episode to in the future. It's thought he was born a free man in Pennsylvania sometime in the 1830s. He eventually drifted west, married into the Santee Sioux, and was even friendly with Sitting Bull at one point. Dorman was serving with the 7th as an interpreter, and I think that he was the only black guy present. Now, even though Wooden Leg stated that he was not scalped or cut up, when Dorman's body was later discovered by soldiers, it was indeed mutilated. And he damn sure wasn't the only one. Wooden Leg even recalled watching the little children count coup on the fallen, stabbing them with arrows as the grieving widows tore at their bodies. Over 260 soldiers were dead and over 50 wounded. As far as casualties among the natives, Wooden Leg claimed just 30. The Cheyennes lost six, and the Lakota, 24. This number would increase in the days to come, however, as the mortally wounded on both sides began passing. Now, throughout these two days of fighting, this large combined camp of Cheyenne and Sioux did not stay in the same location, at least not according to Wooden Leg. Quote, Of the two nights at the battle place, one had been at the first camping spot where the soldiers attacked us, and the other had been at the second camping spot a short distance away where we moved on account of our death losses, end quote. And on the afternoon of the second day, after Wooden Leg allegedly shot at those soldiers retrieving water, the camp broke for good, traveling all that night and all the next day up the Little Bighorn Valley. The Battle of the Little Bighorn was over, and sadly, the free Roman life of the Cheyenne was drawing to an end as well. Now that's all I've got on Wooden Leg today, but I will be continuing this story next week. There's a lot I left out as far as the Cheyenne culture, and I'd love to share the rest of Wooden Leg's life with you. The man would go on to live another 60 years following the Battle of the Greasy Grass. And believe it or not, he'd eventually go to work for the U.S. Army, a job that would see him preparing for battle on a little creek in South Dakota known as Wounded Knee. But that's next week, unless you're just really impatient, and if that's the case, you can find it right now at IntoHistory.com forward slash Wild West Extra. Now, like I said, I will be revisiting many of these topics, especially the Battle of Little Bighorn, coming up within the next year. But I do think the perspective of people like Wooden Leg who were there, who participated, is invaluable. It might not be perfect, but then again, nothing is when it comes to history. Which brings me to the next topic. If you're a repeat listener, you've heard me say over and over again how difficult it can be to separate fact from fiction especially when it comes to a guy like Soapy Smith. That's one of the reasons I'm always throwing in words like allegedly or might have or maybe. Now, a few days ago, I got a very interesting comment on Soapy, and I will read it to you now in full. I thank you very much for keeping the history of Soapy Smith alive. Overall, I enjoyed the program, but if I may correct a few mistakes, I suggest reading the book Soapy Smith, The Life and Death of a Scoundrel. It is bar none the most accurate and source biography of Jefferson Randolph Smith II, alias Soapy Smith. Number one, Charles L. Doc Baggs was not Soapy's mentor. By the time Baggs and Smith met, Smith had learned the business, the two men being rival bosses of two bunco gangs in Denver. Number two, there is no evidence that Jeff's mother ran a boarding house. This story came from one author in Round Rock without any sources. There are several family journals being kept during this time, and none mention any such business. 3. Both Soapy and his cousin Edwin B. Smith did witness the shooting of Sam Bass. Both wrote about the event in their journals. 4. Soapy was never a cowboy. That story comes from a romanticized poem from 1892. 5. There are only stories of when Soapy learned the shell and pea game. 
But as he stayed in Texas, making his first known move to Fort Worth, Texas as a con man in 1878, it is likely there, or beforehand, that he learned the shell and pea game. There are more mistakes, but I can't post them all, as they limit the number of words. By the way, I am a great-grandson of Soapy's. All right, well, first of all, thank you very much. It's a lot of good info. And secondly, if these claims are true, then I do kind of feel like I failed you, my audience. Now, if you'll remember, last week I mentioned a book written by the Smith family titled Alias Soapy Smith. This is the book that that gentleman just mentioned. Its full title being Alias Soapy Smith, The Life and Death of a Scoundrel by Jeff Smith. I presume this is the same Jeff Smith that left that comment. Now, most of the time, I'll read as much as I can on any given topic as I'm preparing these episodes. But I do not read everything available, mostly due to time constraints, but also logistics. So instead, I carefully choose one or two titles that I think will give me the greatest amount of insight on whatever I'm researching. And to be honest, the only reason I didn't pick up a copy of Alias Soapy Smith, The Life and Death of a Scoundrel, is due to its price. I think the cheapest copy I was able to find was like $45 on Amazon with an additional $20 for shipping and handling. So I went with the other book that I mentioned last week titled King Con, The Story of Soapy Smith, written by Jane Haig. And it was this book that I leaned on for the bulk of my research. I felt like it was a good choice considering that Jane Haig is an actual legit historian, PhD and all. What's more, she also includes a pretty extensive bibliography of sources one of which was alias Soapy Smith, the life and death of a scoundrel. Hell, she even brings it up in her introduction. Quote, At the time I completed my research in 2001, I had heard rumors that Smith descendants retained a cache of material on him. However, the vastness of this storehouse treasure trove did not become apparent until Smith's great-grandson, Jeff Smith, completed and published his exhaustively researched biography, alias Soapy Smith. Materials in the family collection cited by Smith include letters, documents, and transcripts of interviews conducted over the last 60 years by Smith family members with Smith associates of all stripes. I have used this new information to add to this new edition and to correct mistakes in the previous edition. For this contribution, I am very grateful to Jeff Smith, end quote. Okay, awesome. Not only did I get my hands on a great source written by a damn doctor of history, but she also revised said book with new information from the Smith family that she got from Alias Soapy Smith. Kind of felt like I got the best of both worlds. Now, how she used Alias Soapy Smith as a source, but came to such drastically different conclusions on so many details, I do not know. Hopefully one of these days I'll be able to pick up a copy and check it out for myself. And who knows, maybe a revised edition of last week's episode will be in the works sometime in the future. Hey, this is Josh now speaking from the future. My assumption that the guy leaving the comment was also the author of Alias Soapy Smith turned out to be correct. He has since emailed me with a link straight to his publisher's website where you can purchase the book for just $26. That's not counting shipping, but that's still a much better deal than the price on Amazon. If you'd like to grab a copy, you can find that link down in this episode's description. I know I get shit wrong from time to time. I also try to point out when I think certain facts are dubious or questionable. And sometimes I'm just flat out wrong. But if I got that much wrong in one episode, I would almost rather just take it down than to keep it circulating. I mean, my main goal, in addition to hopefully keeping you entertained, is also to present these historical figures as accurately as I possibly can with my little pea-sized brain. So yeah, I will always try to let you know if I got anything wrong, and it looks like as far as Soapy Smith goes, I may have gotten quite a bit wrong. If that's the case, my apologies. And just to tie all this back to Wooden Leg, like I mentioned more than once today, he, Wooden Leg, was pretty much my only source. His words, through the work of interpreters and translators, compiled by Thomas B. Marquise and published in 1931. Is it perfectly accurate? I don't know. Should it be weighed against other eyewitness accounts and battle participants and fresh information? Absolutely. And so should each and every one of these episodes here at the Wild West Extravaganza. I do think history is very fluid in that way. You know, what some people refer to as revisionist history is oftentimes just the application of new information. 
And as we all know, new information is uncovered all the damn time. All right, I think that's about all I've got for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Do me a favor, if you like what you hear, do not share this episode with anybody. Don't even tell them about the Wild West extravaganza, okay? I'm begging you. Just keep this between us. I don't want anyone else listening to the show for right now. Both Spotify and YouTube have contacted me and said we're at near capacity. So please, whatever you do, do not immediately log into Facebook and share a link from this episode to everybody you know. Do not go over to wildwestextra.com and hit that merch button and buy a t-shirt or sticker. And please, for the love of all this holy, don't go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash wildwest and donate to the cause. Ugh, just thinking about you doing that makes me physically ill. Till next time, check your sources and try not to scalp anybody's face pubes. Adios. little pea-sized brain.